Welcome to today's talk, Sunday the 5th of February. Now, we want answers as to why more people are dying than usual. The excess deaths are high and we want a breakdown of all the possibilities that could be causing this excess deaths, these excess deaths. Now, this is Esther McVeigh in the British Parliament speaking on this matter. Let's just uh, listen to it. Fairly brief clip. Public health. Mr McVeigh. Mr Speaker. The chief medical officer recently warned that current non-COVID excess deaths is being driven in part by patients not getting statins or blood pressure medicines during the pandemic. But when looking at the data on statins in openprescribing.net, which is based on monthly NHS prescribing, there appears not to be a drop. So where is the evidence? And if there isn't one, what is causing these excess deaths? Will the minister commit to an urgent and thorough investigation yeah, yeah, yeah. on the matter? Minister. Well, we are seeing a, a, an increase in excess deaths in this country, but we're also seeing that in Wales, uh, in Scotland, uh, in Northern Ireland and across Europe. And there are a range of factors. There is an increase, as we saw um, in December, in the number of people being admitted with flu, with COVID and with other uh, healthcare conditions. And this is not something that's just seen in this country, but across Europe as well. Bridget. Well, Esther McVeigh looking somewhat bewildered by that answer. Now, the report where uh, Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, talks about this is in this technical review published back in uh, December. And we did look at this in some detail at the time. So what we need to do now is check on what is, uh, is it true? So the, the Chief Medical Officer is saying that deaths are caused, the excess deaths are caused partly by statins and uh, blood pressure medicines not being available during the pandemic. So that's where he says it. Is it true? Well, this is lipid uh, regulating drugs, which are the statin type, statin type drugs. So here we have uh, January uh, 19. Here we have January uh, 20. So the start of the pandemic there. So this was prescribing before the pandemic. This was prescribing during the pandemic. And there's probably, if anything, up to July 2022, we have a slight increase. So we can see there quite clearly that uh, lipid regulating drugs such as statins, the actual uptake through the pandemic increased slightly, didn't decrease slightly. So it means Esther McVeigh is right and the chief medical officer is wrong. How can the chief medical officer get this wrong? It really does uh, beg a credibility um, that, that, that he, got, he got this wrong. There's the data. And that, that's lipid lowering drugs. Now, as regards hypertension and heart failure, Again, so we've got January 20, uh, uh, January 2020 there. So this is before the pandemic. This is during the pandemic all the way up to 2022. And again, we see there's no reduction in uh, medication for um, hypertension uh, either. So uh, Esther McVeigh is, is completely correct in what she's saying there. No question about it. Now, um, Let's look at this in a little more detail. So the technical reports there from Chris Whitty, the data is showing that he's uh, inaccurate. Um, so does this bring into question the competence of the chief medical officer? I mean, no one's suggesting he's being deliberately disingenuous, of course, but he should have known that. He should have been able to check that data before we put it in his technical report. To me, not acceptable. You know, these are people that we trusted implicitly through the pandemic, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer. Let's hope they're not letting us down. Um, now, um, the data from that we've just looked at there, open prescribing run by Oxford University. Uh, cholesterol meds did not go down during the pandemic. There's the evidence. Blood pressure meds were not taken less frequently during the pandemic. There's the evidence. Now, uh, Esther McVeigh called for an urgent and thorough investigation. And the minister... Um, actually said, well, this isn't this isn't just a problem in England. This is a problem in Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and throughout the world, throughout Europe. I mean, what kind of answer is that? Yes, it's a problem. That's why we that's why we want the answer to this. Um, so to call for an urgent and thorough review is completely reasonable. Now, the reasons that the minister gave there, uh, flu and COVID, we know they don't account for the excess deaths. Uh, but she mentioned other health conditions. Well, yeah, people have other health conditions, uh, and that can cause their death. Um, so what the minister said there was completely nonsensical. Now, the, the, the minister concerned is actually um, Maria Caulfield, who I've actually got a bit of time for Maria Caulfield, really. Um, uh, she, she is the uh, the parliamentary under secretary of state. Um, 
First question there is why wasn't the Minister of Health answering the question? Because this is a pretty serious matter. Now, now Maria Coldfold didn't do uh, philosophy, politics and economics at Oxbridge, and she wasn't a parliamentary private intern as far as I know. She, she came up the hard way. She was a clinical nurse, so um, she, 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 she knows what... Um, sick people and uh, wounds and uh, things smell like she knows the reality of it and yet she could say things that were so patently ridiculous uh, essentially saying this isn't a problem because it's everywhere it's, it, it, her answer was nonsensical so I can't impugn motives onto her but I just wonder given the whole resources of the civil service that she had at her disposal uh, whether Marie Coldfold actually agrees with Esther McVeigh and just had to toe the government line um don't know just just thinking out loud there really but the reason she gave do not account for the excess deaths because we know these are excess deaths in addition to covid yes influenza will count for a few but other health conditions probably account for the vast majority and to say that people are real because they have other health conditions is just preposterous but that's where we're at so answers definitely needed you and me i think agree with esther mcveigh urgent and thorough investigation required because this is all over the place now let's look at a, a report now from the european uh, parliament this is from the um special committee uh, set up by the european parliament this is from christine anderson member of the european parliament who is a member of the special committee on the covid pandemic lessons learned and recommendations for the future so over to this uh, committee uh, now yeah, you may have heard uh, things are unfolding rather quickly right now, uh, thanks to uh, our colleague Rob Ross, who raised the question uh, in the COVID committee, and uh, the Pfizer representative uh, yeah, answered in quite a clear way. So we all know now um, that people have been lied to. Uh, it was a gigantic lie, and uh, on this lie, everything that governments, especially in the Western democracies, did uh, to infringe on, on uh, people's rights, to take away their freedom, to uh, lock them uh, in their homes, uh, imposing curfews. All of this was based on that gigantic lie. And um, yeah, I and can only thank my colleagues. Um, we are doing an incredible job in this COVID committee. And uh, we will get to the bottom uh, of things and we will get the answers that the people that you deserve. We will work on that and we will continue to work on that. But, and that is the other message, none of that would have been possible to do if we did not have the massive, enormous support of you, the people. Because you took to the street, you showed your governments that you will not put up with this and you will not stand for this. And for that, I really thank you and I applaud you and I will do so right now. This applause was for you, the people, because we can only do so much if we do not have the support of you, the people. And as you may have heard, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, EU Commission President, is now under a lot of pressure, and rightly so. The people have a right to know what went on in these contracts with her exchange of SMS with C. Pfizer uh, Burla. The people need to know who they can hold responsible and accountable for whatever may have gone on behind the scenes. So um, yes, thank you again. It was your support that kept us going and that made all of this possible. And things are changing now. Their house of cards is tumbling down and it is doing so rightfully. And you know what? One more thing, though. Um, I am sick and tired of being called a COVID-idiot. <laughs> and I'd much rather be a COVID-idiot than being a gov 
idiot. Because that's what all these people blindly trust. Because that's what all these people that blindly trusted their governments turned out to be. And I will say it again, it was never, never ever about public health. It was never about breaking any waves. It was always about breaking people. But, and that's the good news, they failed. It didn't work. And that I am very proud of, and I'm proud of the people that I am so honored to be allowed to represent, and I will continue to do just that. Thank you very much. So there we go. They were the views of uh, Christine Anderson, member of the European Parliament in Germany, a member of the special committee of the COVID uh, on the COVID nineteen pandemic, lessons learned and recommendations for the future. And of course, we couldn't possibly uh, be in a position to comment on the content of what she said there, but I thought you'd be interested in seeing it. You know, it's great that our elected representatives still have uh, freedom of speech, or relative freedom of speech. It's a pity all of us don't enjoy the same uh, privilege. But uh, for now, thank you for watching. Well, warm welcome to today's talk. Monday the 6th of March. Now I'm going to give some information about the leaks from the British Secretary of State for Health Matt Hancock because I don't be denied about this but I actually think it's in the public interest to look at some of this material. If nothing else that we need to learn for the, from the next uh, for the next pandemic which uh, will inevitably come or other public health crises which uh, inevitably will come as well. Now this is based on this book here now matt hancock secretary of state for health he uh, rushed out a book and i think i think rushed out is the only way to describe it um and he's called it uh, uh what's it called pandemic diaries um the battle inside britain's battle against covid with isabel uh, oakshot now uh, isabel uh, oakshot is the like uh, co-writer of this book and at the end, at the end of the uh, the process, uh, or after the end of the process, the book was written. Um, uh, Isabel Oakshot decided it was in the public interest to release this material, so she did release the material that she'd been given to research the book. So that's the background to this, and I've only picked a few a few examples because um, it does give us an insight into what was going on. Uh, and I think a lot of us feel great frustration, regardless of what side the, the pond you happen to be on. Uh, of uh, leadership during the pandemic was very often really in my view quite appalling um some might say uh, misleading and disingenuous but but um let's not always of course there was good leaders but you know generally i, I i've got this tremendous feeling of being let down uh, by the information i was given by the information i was not given by the way that the information was filtered to me because all we had at the time was what was in the public domain i've no special insight and insight and part of the reason he decided to do this was matt matt hancock did he had access to all of the information so um while um we maybe have all thought and done things where we get in the pandemic that was done on partial information whereas these guys at the top had all the information so anyway let, let's 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 crack on this first one here mac hancock plans to frighten the pants off everyone now um and, and this is a direct quote um he, he did say that frighten the pants off people so was fear used as a deliberate manipulative strategy in the pandemic if so that would really concern me because we want to be able to give people objective information i often got things wrong but i was trying to give i still do get things wrong but i try to give objective information as much as i can based on the information at my disposal um whereas as i said these guys had a lot more uh, information available so matt hancock plans to frighten the pants off everyone about covid um how the health secretary hoped to shock public into complying with ever-changing lockdown rules is the headline now um this is basically a, the leak of these exchanges so secretary of state for health 
Uh, have have you seen the the Dase survey? Now th- this was the Imperial College uh, London uh, React study, which was actually showing that things were getting quite a bit better at the time. But um, did that quite fit the narrative? So Patrick Valance, chief scientific officer, said he'd uh, take a look at it. Um, Matt Hancock, yup, just done presser, presumably a p- press release, where the media interest was only on the gloomy Cambridge survey. But if you want to, if we want people to behave themselves, maybe that's not a bad thing. So focusing on a gloomy survey with increasing cases, because at the time it was very localised, wasn't it? There'd be increasing cases in one part of the country and not in a, another part of the country. And then the, the, the chief scientific officer actually says this, agree, uh, suck up their miserable interpretations and over deliver. Um, is over deliver another way of saying don't give the full, don't don't give the truth objectively. Um, you can interpret that with whatever word you would like to use. Um, but that that's what he said. That that's the direct quote there. Suck up their miserable in, uh, interpretations and over deliver. Does this over delivery veer into things which are untrue? Well, one would certainly hope not. This is the chief scientific officer we're talking about, the one who worked for Galaxo Smith Klein and uh, cashed in quite a few shares from GlaxoSmithKline during the pandemic. Not that I'd influenced him at all. Um, Questions to answer here, isn't there? Really questions to answer. Okay, these these are just, they're just WhatsApp messages. And of course, (laughs) needless to say, they didn't expect these to come into the public domain. So have I made quick messages that could be taken out of context? Yes, but the point is this story is developing into a bit of a theme. Um... And then again, sounds like, uh, th- th- so this is the mayor of Sadiq Khan, the mayor of um, of uh, London, this is the mayor of Manchester, who'd pushed back on the lockdowns. And this uh, Dame in Pool, Department of Health uh, Media Special Advisor, um, Tory MPs are future about the, furious about the lockdown. Uh, Matt Hancock, we frightened the pants of everyone with the new strain. Uh, they didn't want Brexit to take uh, priority. So... Was clear was fear being used as a deliberate strategy there? Disproportionate fear? That 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 could be argued. Um, it's not it's not really what we would expect. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, at all criticising the uh, the casual language here. I mean, this is the language. I don't know what you'd say in the states, but to frighten the pants off someone it is a standard saying in the UK. I'm not knocking that because he thought he was just talking amongst friends it, it, or amongst colleagues. It's the sentiment that we're interested in. Um, then then this is really strange. Matt Hancock, when do we deploy the new variant? Now this was at the time when the alpha variant was coming to prevalence. So. When did we deploy the variant? Now, of course, we're not saying that, that Matt Hancock was somehow in control of the variant. Presumably, what he meant was, when do we deploy the information about the new variant? Variant. Well, I would have thought as early and as transparently as possible would be the answer and allow the public to make informed adult decisions. But it seemed to be deployed in a strategic way, arguably. As you see, these are open to interpretation. Um... So this is Damon Poole, been thinking about uh, the new, this is talking about the new variant. And of course, the alpha variant was quite bad. Uh, I think you made the point earlier, we need to keep schools off. So Matt Hancock agreeing that schools needed to be, uh, remain closed down. Uh, Damien Poole didn't want anyone leaking from the senior ranks. Um, And he said, big risk with the variant, right wing papers go for a renewed push for let it rip. So that, in other words, don't try and control the spread of the virus. On the basis of the vaccine strategy is undermined, Matt Hancock. That's why we reassure on the vaccines. So Matt Hancock, clearly very pro-vaccination. What additional information did he have about possible adverse events of the adverse effects of the vaccines at the time? don't really know but seems from that to me they didn't want anything to get in the way of the uh, the vaccination program that seemed to be a priority and um of all the all the from whatsapp messages that have been released that i've seen would be interesting to know about this from we get the full analysis is i haven't seen natural immunity mentioned once 
vaccines, yes. Natural immunity, this wonderful mechanism we all have. I haven't seen a mention of it yet. Uh, maybe the full analysis will prove me wrong that they were talking about it all the time, but I suspect not. Um, how Matt Hancock sought to hog the COVID vaccine limelight. So was this vaccination program seen as some particular um, political win on, on the part of the Secretary of State for Health? Um, this is what this seems to imply. Um, wanted the credit for the vaccination program. Front pages on vaccines are unreal. You are totally right. I must own this. So he wants to own the vaccination uh, program. Um, strangely enough, we haven't heard anything about from him lately on the vaccination program that I've heard uh, talking about potential adverse events of a vaccination and the uh, the limited efficacy of vaccination. Um, maybe he only wanted to own it for a period of time. Um I need to meet the scientists who is at the same Oxford College I was. <laughs> this <laughs> in the UK we call this the old boys network. It stinks, you know. M m mates, mates from college, old school tie, old boy. No, no, no. Anyway, anyway, that seems to be what he wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> they will forgive you for being in favour of lockdowns if they think you are working night and day for a vaccine. So this, this belief that vaccination was the only way out, which was fed down to all of us. Um, where, where's the counter argument here? There doesn't seem to be any obvious counter argument. Anyway, vaccine approval is finally cut from uh, 20 days to five days. And now this is uh, concerning medicines and healthcare. Regulatory authority briefing is pretty sure. I hope there's no intimation here that uh, the vaccine approval strategies were somehow curtailed. Let's hope that's not the case, because we were completely assured that everything was done as it normally would be for any new uh, pharmaceutical product. Let's hope this is not undermining uh, the veracity of that. Vaccine approval is finally cut from 20 days to five. OK, these are just notes. It is sometimes hard to know what they mean, but I don't like the sound of cutting vaccine approval in the light of what we now know but isn't that good news is it true I believe it's true at last uh, a turbo booster for jab so that's in tomorrow's so that was in the newspaper at the time matt hancock i called for this two months ago this is a hancock triumph and if it is, we need to accelerate massively. So good old Matt Hancock, eh? Triumphed it. Triumphed, triumphed. Anyway, just the, the last example. I mean, we could give lots, but this is the last one I'm going to give here. Matt, Matt, no, a couple more maybe. Matt, Matt Hancock uh, chose saving face over under and over ending unnecessary pandemic. Now, the ping-demic, of course, was people being alerted on the phone that they had to self-isolate. And Matt Hancock was told that he was overcooking this one, um, but ignored it because he didn't want to appear wrong uh, for the past. And I just wonder how many things that the government is still plugging now, governments around the world are still plugging now, because they, if they change their mind now, that would have, they would have to admit they'd been wrong in the past. How many things are being done now because governments don't want to admit they were wrong in the past? Um... Of course, we don't know that now, but but let's have a look at this pandemic. 600,000 pinged a week at some stage uh, resulted in more than 20 million people being, that's a third of the population in the UK, <coughs> being told to self-isolate, regardless of whether they had symptoms for 14 days. At that time, it also included travellers. And it was another month until the quarantine period for, the ping, for being pinged was taken down to 10 days. And the scheme wasn't scrapped up until February 2022. Um, quite incredible, really. Now, the, the relevant exchange here is this. Um, so, Matt Hancock, where are we on test to release date? Uh, and this is Chris Whitty, a physician, like, 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 um, like the chief scientific officer, actually both physicians, Patrick Valance 
uh, Chief Medical Officers and Special Advisory Group for Emergencies in favour of a pilot with uh, presumption in favour of testing for five days in lieu of isolation. So testing for five days in lieu of isolation, alternative to 10 days isolation, but it, of course it was 14. So we have got the Chief Medical Officer saying, well, let's go for five days of uh, testing rather than 14 days of isolation. Uh, and at the time we were told that they were following the science so Matt Hancock says, so uh, test every day just for five days. That sounds like a massive loosening. Chris Fitty says, that's what the modelling suggests. And Max says, uh, I'm amazed that sounds very risky and we can't go backwards. Wouldn't test every day for 10 days be a safer starting point. So, and then the conversation goes on. So um, rather than following the science, he's arguing about it looking like for the sake of political expediency we're not the government's not coming looking good out of this uh, and uh, as indeed are many of these others involved this one's um this one amusing or not and i'll, ju I'll just put, i'll tell you it straight let me tell you uh, bill gates new variant assessment platform so th this was the government in the uk we've got some labs that are very good at looking for new variants and we wanted to roll this out and basically sell it around the world so that's what that's about, new variant assessment platform, um, which we wanted to, well, fair, fair enough, uh, uh, use that around the world. Have you spoken to uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO, about, the, uh, about this thing here, the new variant assessment platform? Yes, message, no promises, but I'm trying to land Bill Gates. So this is Damon Poole. This is the um, Department of Health Media Special Advisor. We have, the, we have loads of these special advisors in the UK. No one, I don't quite know what they do, but I think they get paid a lot to advise senior politicians. Um, no promises, but I'm trying to land Bill Gates' endorsement of the platform. Uh, Matt Hancock, tell him, tell him that considering how many people I'm getting his chips in, injected into, he owes me one. So um, there's almost an implication here that Bill Gates was gaining financially from, from the vaccine rollout. Um, but anyway, this was treated as a joke. Um, how many people I'm getting his chips injected? Tell him that considering how many people I'm getting his chips injected into, he owes me one. So that was the, the joke. Now, many conspiracy theories were said to have been inspired by pro-Kremlin outlets, according to the Telegraph. And in the end, Mr. Gates didn't actually um, support the British government's rollout of this um, variant identification programme. So there we go. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, of course, the big implication for the next pandemic, where we could improve, is get better politicians next time. Uh, at least uh, more transparent, more open, who gives us the full information, doesn't try and uh, manage what information that uh, us little people are able to cope with and uh, gives us a truthful ongoing assessment of the situation. So more transparency required there. In this case, provided retrospectively. And uh, I suspect Mr Hancock is probably somewhat ruining the day he decided to get his side of the story out so quickly, uh, because a lot of it's now in the... Uh, some of the material is in the public domain. So all published in the Telegraph. Uh, the, the problem with Telegraph is actually paywalled, so you'd have to take a subscription out if you want to read it all in detail. But you can, you know, take it out for a few weeks and cancel it, I suppose. Um, it, interesting, and I suspect more to come on that. Um, I, I think that was in the public interest for me to put that out. So I, I'm, I think, I'm pretty sure I will put this online. I think it's, I think I've only said what is reported in the texts. Um, my overwhelming feeling now, disappointment. Betrayal, Disapp certainly disappointment. Extreme disappointment that we weren't given the information at the time to allow us to process it accurately and, and fully. Thank you for watching. Hello and warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 15th of March. Now, questions are now being asked, I'm pleased to say, 
in the UK Parliament about the excess deaths which are still around, actually in most countries in the world. I'm going to play you a couple of those in a minute. For now, let's just get some orientation from the European data. And we see that there's been excess deaths here from this is March 2022 all the way through to December uh, 2022. So we see that the excess deaths have been in the range of 7 to about 18 percent at the moment or for December. This is the Eurostat data. That's the latest data that's available. So excess deaths through all of 2022. And these are not attributable to COVID-19, or at least a lot of them are not attributable. The majority are not attributable to COVID-19. So let's go over to the first question in the House now. This one is from Esther uh, McVeigh, Member of Parliament. Team, Mr Speaker. Uh, oh, Mr Speaker, in my letter to my right honourable friend, I noted that it's likely a combination of factors has contributed to potential excess deaths, including high flu prevalence, ongoing uh, COVID-19, uh, and the disruption to um, the treatment and the detection of uh, conditions like heart diseases. But I know that my honourable friend, is, right honourable friend, is very thoughtful about this and follows it closely, and I will endeavour to get her more detail. Mr. Mike, Mr Speaker, well, I'm pleased my question has now resulted in a response for which I'm grateful. However, uh, from that response, I was none the wiser how the government has explained the non-COVID excess deaths we'd seen. So can the minister give us an insight into the reasons for the non-COVID excess deaths since the pandemic? Well, Mr. Well, Mr Speaker, even if we just take one particular disease like um, uh, CVD, uh, we see that there was disruption to both screening and then to referrals and then on to treatment from the COVID pandemic. And this was uh, noted at the time that this would happen and there would be consequences from it. But let me set out in more detail to her all the exact uh, th facts and figures on this, because I know she's been following it very closely. Good. So it looks like Esther McVeigh is going to be given uh, more details on that. I wouldn't hold your breath, judging by the quality of the minister's answer there. CVD is not a term we use. Cardiovascular disease, maybe ischemic heart disease, but it's just not a term we would normally use. So basically, he said nothing, and, and Esther McVeigh there said she's none the wiser. So uh, disappointing that um, members of Parliament aren't getting a satisfactory answer. Let's look at the question asked by Mr uh, Andrew Bridges, Andrew another Bridget. member of Parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, after a pandemic which uh, saw considerable excess deaths, we'd normally expect a period where there'd be less than the expected number of deaths, as those who sadly passed before their time during the pandemic reduced the figures of the numbers passing after. That's not what we're seeing, Mr Speaker. Indeed, when looking at the deaths registered weekly in England and Wales, produced by the ONS, excess mortality in England, produced by the Office for Health Improvement, and the disparities and mortality monitor, produced by Continuous Mortality Investigation, the Office for Statistics Regulation stated last month all three do reflect the trend of a marked increase in excess deaths. Can we please, therefore, have a debate in government time on excess deaths, an issue which sadly affects every constituency and every community in the land? Well, I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for, for raising this. It is incredibly important that we, uh, that we analyse and we learn from our experiences in the pandemic to ensure that we are as prepared as we can be uh, if, God forbid, uh, such circumstances rise again. Uh, I think this is an issue that uh, a lot of members across the House will want to focus on, and uh, I would encourage him to apply for a debate in the usual way. Well, that was uh, Penny Mordant, the minister, and um, if she gave an answer there, I don't think I quite caught it. She shares the concern, which is good, and she's worried about another pandemic, which, yes, is a potential, um, but basically we weren't given any answers to the excess deaths. So, Good to see that people, these questions are being asked. Uh, now, it's good to see that Andrew Bridgen had a couple of dozen MPs there because the last time he spoke when we recorded it, when he was looking at the uh, his concern over vaccine uh, potential harms, um, there was about seven people in the entire house, which was a complete disgrace. So a few more people there for, for Mr Bridgen, which I'm delighted to, to see. Now, let's look at some more... Um, data while we wait for the ministers which are who are so keen to help um, let's wait for them to get back to us but there again we've been waiting this is the European data we've been waiting for over a year now so quite why we're paying these guys I'm not sure anyway this is the um, this is the um, excess mortality deaths from all causes in di different countries now this is high here of course because of the the pandemic ways we would expect that but we do see that it still remains high. 
So here, here we see that we've got above average figures in Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Canada. Uh, we're seeing above average deaths, not all attributable to COVID, the majority not attributable to COVID in all these countries. And we're still not getting satisfactory answers as to why this is. Why aren't governments giving us the answers that we deserve? Pe people are dying more than they should. Very frustrating, absolutely frustrating. Um, now, this is the uh, this is the table we've looked at before from the Office of National Statistics. Uh, you might remember that the black is the five year average. Uh, the green is uh, none attributable to COVID. The blue is attributable to COVID. Now, we had hoped that the deaths had gone down a bit lately and, and they had. But we noticed that again, now we have uh, an excess in uh, increase in excess deaths as we did basically for all of uh, 2022. Now our world in data is also giving us information on uh, excess deaths. Um, now as of the 5th of March, now they updated this on the 5th of March, it doesn't mean say all countries were up to date on that because some countries are, uh, the, the data is really quite, uh, quite a lot slower than we would, would, we would hope for. Australia, 16% uh, excess deaths, Brazilian, Brazil 10%, this is as of the 5th of March update. Canada, 2%, questionable data in Canada. Ireland, 31%, Netherlands, increase of 6%. New Zealand, an increase of 13%, Scotland, 5%, UK as a whole, 3%, US, 2%. Uh, all these countries have got uh, increasing excess deaths from the data that was assimilated on the 5th of March, 2023. A few countries going down. So Bulgaria, excess deaths were down. Eastern European country, Czechia, uh, down 6%. Germany, now the excess in Germany had been very high. So they are down now, which is a relief to see, but they had been very high. Poland and Sweden all down uh, somewhat. Um, but the majority of countries, as we'll see on the European graphic, are up. Now here we're looking at the data directly from the Eurostat site for the 27 European countries that we looked at. And there's that uh, line diagram that we noticed showing excess deaths in the European Union as an average all the way through, uh, or at least from March 2022. But there's more data here in the form of this bar graph. Now this actually shows the various countries uh, per month. So this is the data for the 12th uh, the 12th month 2022 that's for the 11th month uh, that's for the uh, the 10th month and we get it all the way uh, through the the year for any month you'd care to look at but let's look at december's data here uh, as an example and we see that the figures in december in iceland the excess deaths were about what 40 43 percent uh, in germany in december the excess deaths were um, pretty high there, about what, 37, 37 point, 37%, 37.3. So we see the high in uh, Austria, Slovenia, Ireland, France, Czechia, Switzerland, Netherlands, Estonia, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Lithuania, Belgium. And this is the European average here. And remember, this is looking at the average for December 2022. And we see excess deaths in all of these countries, except these few exceptions here. Romania, where there was uh, less deaths than expected. Bulgaria, where there was less than expected. And Liechtenstein, where there was less than expected. But for most European countries, uh, for most months of the year, even if we go back to March, for example, we see very high uh, excess deaths. That's the data for uh, April. That's the data for May. So um, really um, quite concerning levels of excess deaths in Europe throughout 2022. And again, the European Parliament is not providing clear reasons why this is. We have the data, but we don't have the explanation. Um, just to finish, let's look at the Office for UK, Office for National Statistics data. Um, this is the week ending the 3rd of March 2023. 526 deaths involving COVID-19 registered, 4.1% of all deaths. 13,593 deaths were registered in the UK in that week, 
7.1% above the five-year average. So we see these deaths are not all attributable to COVID. So questions have been asked in the, in the, in the House of Commons. Um, let's hope we get some definitive answers because I must say all of the clips we've looked at, I found the minister's rep responses uh, pathetic. Why aren't they giving us open, transparent responses? Because we want a transparency of information. This is supposed to be a democracy. Let's share the data. We can analyse it ourselves. We've got experts to analyse it. Just give us the data. Give us the reasoning. And um, let's stop all this uh, political doublespeak. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Well, welcome to this talk. It's uh, Thursday the 16th of March now. It's starting to look like there's been an international conspiracy among some of the world's most senior scientists. Now that sounds utterly absurd, but that's the way it's starting to look. Now I'm going to play you a couple of clips today from the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, uh, which is holding a hearing on the origins of uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, so I'm going to play you the first clip now and then we'll talk about it. And um, really, it looks like you couldn't make this stuff up. It's absolutely incredible. So let's go straight over to the hearing now. I now recognize Ms. Maliotakis from New York for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairman. For two years, myself and the other Republicans on this subcommittee connected the dots we exposed the evidence supporting our strong belief that COVID was developed and leaked from the Wuhan lab. And during those same two years, the same Democrats that sit on this committee, they only hindered, they obstructed, they refused to hold hearings and get to the truth. Now we see mounting evidence supporting the COVID-19 originated from the lab in Wuhan, China, run by the Communist Chinese uh, Party. And this hearing is about getting to the truth. I thank the chairman for making this the very first hearing because the American people who have seen just as many fellow Americans die from COVID, as nearly as many die from COVID, that died in every war since the American Revolution combined, deserve to know the truth. Uh, Dr. Redfield, you pointed to the lab leak theory even before we did. In mid-January of 2020, you expressed concerns to Dr. Fauci to uh, Jeremy Farrer of UK's Wellcome Trust and to Dr. Tedros of World Health Organization that, quote, we had to take the lab leak hypothesis with extreme seriousness. And you urged Dr. Fauci to investigate both the lab and the natural hypotheses. Shortly thereafter, on February 1st, uh, Farrer convened a meeting of a group of 11 top scientists across five time zones and asked Dr. Fauci to join. And he wrote, quote, my preference is to keep this group really tight. Obviously, ask everyone to treat in total confidence, unquote. Dr. Redfield, you were excluded from this call, but up until then, you had been on every single, you were included in every other conversation. What changed? Why do you think that you were excluded from these conversations? Thank you very much. I think uh, just to emphasize, uh, in, in, in early to mid-January, I did have multiple calls with Fauci, Farrar, and, and, and Tedros about how important I thought it was that science get engaged in, in aggressive, aggressively pursuing both hypotheses. I also expressed, as a clinical virologist, that I felt it was um, not scientifically plausible that this virus went from a bat to humans and became one of the most infectious viruses that we have for humans. All viruses are not the same. So when you look at coronaviruses with, for SARS and MERS, for example, when they entered the human species, which they did via an intermediate, they never learned how to go human to human. Even to this day, they don't know how to go human to human. So you can't equate Ebola with a coronavirus. Now, why do, you, why do you think you were excluded from those calls? I, I, because it was, it was told to me that uh, they wanted a single narrative and that I obviously had a different point of view. Okay. In emails following the conference call, four of the 11 scientists told Fauci that they all found the genetic sequence inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory, basically what you're saying. However, just three days later, these four scientists had drafted a paper arguing the exact opposite, and that's now the infamous proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. 
Our investigations show that this paper was prompted by Dr. Fauci, among others, with a goal to disprove the lab leak theory. What is the likelihood that these scientists came across additional information just three days after making these statements to conclude with such certainty that COVID-19 came from nature instead of the lab leak that they thought it was three days earlier? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate. Again, I've said this before, that this whole approach that was taken on January, uh, February 1st and subsequently in the month of February, if you really want to be truthful, it's antithetical to science. Thank you. Science has debate, and they squashed any debate. Thank you. Given what we know now and looking at all the conversations in February of 2020 and before the release of the paper, do you think that uh, Dr. Fauci used this paper to hide the gain-of-function research created the Gain of function research created this virus. I can't talk about Fauci's motivation. Do you think that the paper does hide the truth? I think it's an inaccurate paper that basically was part of a narrative that they were creating. Remember, this pandemic did not start in January at the seafood market. We now know there was infections all the way back into September. This was a narrative that was decided that they were going to say this came from the wet market and they were going to do everything they could to support it to negate any discussion about the possibility that this came from a laboratory. i got 20 seconds left. Dr. Fauci was affirmatively told in, told in an email that uh, NIAID had a monetary relationship with the Wuhan uh, Institute through uh, EcoHealth Alliance. He, he was told this in January 27th of 2020. Do you think that Dr. Fauci intentionally lied under oath to Senator Paul when he vehemently denied NIH's funding of gain-of-function research? I think there's no doubt that NIH was funding gain-of-function research. Is it likely that American tax dollars funded the gain-of-function research that created this virus? I think it did, not, not only from NIH, but from the State Department, USAID, and from DOD. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Wow, that is just uh, pretty incredible, isn't it? So um, just the characters here. So the, 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 this is uh, Nicole uh, uh, Mal 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 Malacartus, um, New York Senator. And that, of course, was Dr. Robert Redfield, the director for the Centers for Disease Control. He urged Dr. Fauci to investigate. And Sir Jeremy Farrer, the director of the Wellcome Trust, former professor of tropical medicine, Oxford University seems to have been in this uh, link. And um, Dr. Tedros, of course, which was no great surprise from the uh, so-called World, World Health Organization. They wanted a really tight group with total confidence. It's just unbelievable. This is the antithesis of science. And and, and do Dr. Dr. Redfield, that, Redfield there, as, as a clinical virologist said that the evolutionary jump really just, just doesn't make any sense. Of course, I've never found the intermediate species. You know, can there be any question now that this is a lab leak? Um, 11 scientists all agreed um, that it couldn't, it couldn't come from a natural origin. And then a few days later, they wrote, uh, they wrote this, uh, this paper here, or they worked out on this paper here somehow. Proximal origin of SARS coronavirus 2. And um, one sentence here is, our analysis clearly shows that SARS coronavirus 2 is not a laboratory con construct or purposefully manipulated virus. Now, this is published in Nature magazine. At this time, we believed that scientific journals were as good as we got, the closest thing we got to truth. Now it looks like it's, it's all been a complete sham. And so these people here, um, these authors, surely they now have questions to answer. Uh, Department of Immunology and Microbiology, uh, California. Um, this one is from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. This one is from um, School of Public Health of uh, Columbia University, in New York. Um, School of Life and Environmental Sciences, School of Medical Science, University of Sydney, Australia. I mean, <laughs> is, 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 this appears to be an international conspiracy. It is quite unbelievable because apparently this group of 11 scientists who were on this call, we were not told who they were, but they got together, agreed it was evolutionarily impossible for this virus to jump. And then we got this paper here just, and this paper was first published on the 17th of March, 2020. Um, quite incredible. Um, 
And then, of course, talk about Dr. Fauci there. Now, D Dr. Fauci assured us that he was the science. Is that what he said? I am the science. So in other words, if you disagree with me, you're disagreeing with science. Now, some might think that's a little bit arrogant for someone who's got uh, about 40 years of administrative experience. Uh, plenty of articles on this. This is one of the more uh, amusing ones I found here, uh, where uh, Elon Musk uh, Elon Musk was uh, commenting on that this this I am science statement that refuted all criticism of COVID policy. Um, just how, how can a scientist say I am the science? It's just the arrogance is just beyond description. Science works by uh, th this dialectic progression of arguments. So Dr. Fa Doc Doc Dr. Redfield there, former director of uh, <clears throat> Centers for Disease Control, National Institutes of Health Money went to the Eco Health Alliance, that went to Wuhan. No doubt, National Institutes of Health Funding funded gain-of-function research in the Wuhan uh, laboratory. It's, it really couldn't make it up. Now, I'm going to play you one more clip because this adds quite a lot of uh, context that's pretty useful from, from the same hearings. Let's, uh, let's listen to this one uh, I now. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Comer, from Kentucky, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the prevailing themes of the pandemic has been scientists' use of the media to downplay the lab leak theory. Mr. Wade, in your career, you worked at Nature Magazine. Science Magazine and the New York Times, would you agree that the scientific establishment used the media to downplay the lab leak theory? Microphone. Uh, that's a complicated issue, Mr. Coma. I think the media uh, was used. It was used in this uh, particular campaign to establish the natural origin um, theory. Um, uh, the, the scientific community uh, is is very afraid to speak up on political issues. And I think the reason is that um, the government grants are handed out through this system of peer, mm -hmm. uh, peer review committees. Right. And so you don't, want, you don't want any single scientist on your peer review committee to vote against you. Uh, therefore, because you'll, you won't get your grant, it's so competitive. So therefore, scientists are, are very reluctant to get it to say anything that is politically divisive or might turn other scientists off against them. This, this means that they cannot be relied upon in the way that I think we would like them to, to be independent and forthright right. and call right. it as they see it. Okay. Well, we, we saw this first with the proximal origin paper that said, quote, our analysis clearly showed that COVID-19 is not a laboratory construct or a purposely manipulated virus, end quote. This was first published on February 17th of 2020. Each witness, I have a simple question, yes or no. Was there science available to make such an unequivocal statement against the possibility of a lab leak that early on in February of 2020, Dr. Absolutely Mark. no. Mr. Wade. Uh, no, it was not. Yeah, I, I don't have sufficient, I don't have sufficient frame of reference to give an answer. No. Next, Peter Dosick of EcoHealth Alliance orchestrated a letter in The Lancet, a prestigious journal, on February 19, 2020, that said, quote, we strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin, end quote. Each witness, yes or no, is the possibility COVID-19 leaked from a lab a conspiracy theory? Dr. Absolutely not. No. Uh, uh, I would say no, but also um, it has been approached as such. Dr. No. Redfield. Dr. Redfield, I want to stick with you. you. You have said before that you were locked out of conversations about the lab leak by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins. Do you think they kept you out of the conversations because you believe COVID-19 may have come from a lab? Yeah, I think I made it very clear in January to all of them why we had to aggressively pursue this. And I let them know as a virologist that I didn't see that this was anything like SARS or MERS because they never learned how to transmit human to human, that I felt this virus was too infectious for humans. There was a lot of evidence that lab actually published in 2014 that they put the H2 receptor into humanized mice so it could infect human tissue. I think you know we had to really uh, seriously go after the fact it came from the lab. 
And they knew that that was how I was thinking, although I thought we had to go after both hypotheses. And I was told later, uh, I didn't know I was excluded. I didn't know there was a February 1st conference call until the Freedom of Information came out with the emails. And right. I was quite upset as the CDC director that I was exclu excluded from those discussions. Oh, oh, why would they do this? Because I had a different point of view, and I was told they made a decision that they would keep this confidential until they came up with a single narrative, which I will argue is antithetical to science. Science never selects a single narrative. We foster, as my colleague here just said, we foster debate. Mm -hmm. And we, we're confident that with debate, science will eventually get to the truth. This was an a priori decision that there's one point of view that we're going to put, out there and anyone who doesn't agree with it is going to be sidelined and as i say i was only the cdc director right. and i was sidelined well i think dr fauci and dr collins got caught with their hand in the cookie jar they got caught supercharging viruses in an unsecure chinese lab they wanted to push the envelope and so they got together to cover themselves cover up their story and wipe their fingerprints of the virus that has killed more than one million americans uh, to quote Jurassic Park, they were, quote, so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should, end quote. Good grief. Right, okay. Um, supercharged the virus. So that's James Comer, a uh, uh, congressperson from, uh, congressman from Kentucky, uh, the chair of the committee. So Mr. Wade there involved in a lot of publishing, saying saying that the government grants are basically awarded to people who don't rock the boat. Therefore, there wasn't a lot of boat rockers. You know, we needed a man and a woman to stand in the gap. And uh, did we get one? Well, not, not many. And those that we did were silenced by the media. And of course, most of us were swilling around in complete ignorance. We were treated like utter mushrooms during this time. Naively, it now turns out, trusting international scientists, taking them at their word, believing that the peer review process for journals worked and would filter out inaccurate material, when in actual fact this was published in peer-reviewed journals. The Nature Journal, the Lancet Journal, I mean, the, 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 these are, we thought, these were the bedrock. The, the, the damage this has done to confidence in science is, is, is indescribable. The scientific process is still probably the best way we've got of getting to truth. It's the way that it's, it's handled by human beings that's the problem. It's not knocking science, but the way, the way science has been done has been completely discredited, in my view. Um, I do like, the, I love the way Dr. Redfield was so definitive in answering his questions. Uh, no. <laughs> what he talked about there was um, ACE2 receptor. This is probably how the gain of function was done. ACE2 receptor was put into humanized mice. Now, this is genetic uh, jiggery pokery. And, and basically what they do is they'll take a human gene, in this case, the gene to make the ACE2 receptor, which of course is where the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein fits in. They put that gene into a mouse. So you get a, you get a mouse that's part human and, and, and part mouse. It still looks like a mouse, but it's got a human gene in or several human genes. Uh, to make this ACE2 receptor. Now, some, some of you might find the idea of these transgenic human mice organisms uh, distasteful uh, to begin with, but that appears to be what they did. Then they could continuously reinfect the mice with the SARS coronavirus 2. Multiple generations of infection take out the, the, uh, the variants which were more transmissible between mice. And because it, this was done in mice, but it was actually a human uh, ACE2 receptor, then by definition, it was going to be more transmissible in mice. So Middle East respiratory similar syndrome that Dr. Redfield talked about, SARS coronavirus 1, which Dr. Redfield talked about, weren't that transmissible. The reason we had the pandemic is firstly that the SARS coronavirus 2 was highly transmissible. And secondly, that it, um, it was um, transmissible before the patients were, were fully uh, symptomatic or even before they were symptomatic at all. And that doesn't happen with natural evolution. Or if it did, the intermediate animal species with hosts would be there and, and the, the pandemic would have emerged at different places at different times. That didn't happen. And, and uh, I'm just really pleased that the truth is, is coming to light now. Um, the disillusionment, the um, betrayal, 
let down by governments. I mean, we believe our senior scientific officer at the time might have been involved in trying to dampen down, shall we say, uh, the lab leak hypothesis. Um, the most se- some of the most senior scientists in the world, uh, I feel, betrayed um, because the information we're given at the time didn't allow us to see this. It's now coming out and um, it's just a complete international uh, disgrace. Um, so it now looks like American money funded the research that went to Wuhan that caused the release of the accidental release of the virus and that caused the pandemic. This is now um, a very real possibility and let's hope that this this uh, committee can come to some uh, definitive conclusions and I think um, that there's a reasonably good chance that it will. Um, hopefully we'll be hearing from Dr Fauci and Dr Collins who according to uh, Mr James Comer got their hand caught in the cookie jar. Let's hope that we hear from them soon. Unbelievable. Um, absolutely unbelievable. Um, I'll leave it there while I'm still in professional mode. And uh, Thank you for watching. Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Friday the 17th of March. Now, today in the British Parliament, Mr Andrew Bridging gave an incredibly well thought out, well researched speech because he's concerned about um, potential adverse events following COVID vaccination. Now, as soon as he started to speak, everyone from the uh, Houses of Parliament left. It was like a walkout protest. It's just a national disgrace. There was two Conservative MPs left apart from Mr Bridge, and there was three on the front bench who had to be there. There was no one from Labour, no one from the Liberal Democrats, zero MPs from the Scottish Nationalists, just a complete disgrace. I can only assume they're under orders not to attend because it really was quite incredible. And um, you can just see the empty benches for yourself. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. Um, um, obviously, Mr. Bridgen is privileged and can say things I'm not allowed to say. So let's give him our attention now because it is a remarkably good speech. And it does cover a lot of the points that we have talked about ourselves recently on this on this channel. So over to uh, Mr. Bridgen now. Bridgen. Mr Deputy Speaker, on the 13th of December last year, I was kindly granted an adjournment debate on the potential harms that emergency use experimental mRNA COVID-19 vaccines cause. It's fair to say that night my life changed. During that speech, in, uh, in the evidence data I presented to the House, which no one has effectively rebutted, I highlighted to the Minister the scale of harms that the experimental vaccines have caused and continue to cause. In giving that speech to an almost empty chamber on this most important of issues, quite literally life and death, two things happened to me immediately. First, I was cancelled by the mainstream media, despite sending a data sheet in the wake of the debate, scientifically evidencing every point that I made. No, not one media organisation wanted to talk about the issue of serious harms or death occurring as a result of the mRNA vaccines. Mr Deputy Speaker, I fully expect that they will show the same level of disinterest in today's debate. It's what we've come to expect from a media more interested in navel-gazing at the pontifications of Britain's foremost football pundit instead of the horror and tragedy of excess deaths taking place before their very eyes. Some three months on from that speech and a scattering of reports are now appearing in the mainstream media Sadly, the number of people affected in the UK and across the world cannot be ignored or hidden indefinitely. I will on that point. Uh, Will you accept that there is a bit of light on the horizon in that this week alone, the Daily Express has had four full pages on this subject? I thank my right honourable friend. He's a stalwart supporter for those who've been vaccine harmed, and I do hope that we can see some light at the end of the tunnel. And hopefully, this speech today will bring more light into the darkness. In truth, uh, I care little about being cancelled by the media because, in the wake of that speech, something far more important has happened. I was contacted by thousands of people offering their support, 
and received many hundreds and hundreds of emails from all over the globe recounting to me their own stories of the harms caused in the wake of their or their loved ones COVID vaccination. I've been contacted by parents in my own and surrounding constituencies thanking me for questioning why we're giving these experimental vaccinations to healthy children and young people that patently do not need them and gain no protection from them. I was contacted by far too many relatives who had lost loved ones suddenly after having the Moderna, Pfizer or AstraZeneca experimental gene therapy treatments shot into their arms. Many of them asked in their emails why this vitally important issue was not being taken more seriously by many of my honourable and right honourable colleagues. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a question for my colleagues to answer. A lot more questioned why, as evidence continues to emerge almost on a daily basis, the fourth estate was so remiss in its coverage. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a question for the lobby to answer. But every one of those who contacted me asked me to keep up the fight, to continue to raise awareness of vaccine harms and vaccine deaths. Mr Deputy Speaker, that is the question I am here to answer today. Despite the media silence, there is huge, enormous and growing interest in this topic. So today I once again ask the Minister why more is not being done, both in the United Kingdom and globally, to investigate and publicise the clear and well-documented adverse effects of COVID-19 vaccines. Vaccines, Mr Deputy Speaker, that have made Big Pharma billions, but also vaccines that have resulted in completely unprecedented levels of yellow card reports. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government's own data in this respect is damning. It is interesting that only this week the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, have announced that they will no longer be publicly reporting the yellow card updates from the reported harms of these experimental treatments. Can the Minister explain the reasoning behind this decision, especially given that the number of yellow card reports of adverse events are far higher for the experimental COVID-19 vaccine than the total yellow card reports of all conventional vaccines administered for the last 50 years. Mr Deputy Speaker, if you'll grant me a little leeway, let me start by looking at data from the US state of Florida and the reported level of vaccine harms there. Prior to the COVID pandemic, there were never more than 2,500 incidents per year of harms reported to the state Surgeon General as a direct result of vaccination. In 2021, that number shot up to over 41,000 cases, a surge of more than 1,600%. Of course, some will understandably point out that the increase in cases was inevitable as more vaccines were being administered. The answer to that, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the state of Florida, there was a 400% increase in vaccine administration in 2021, not 1,600%. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the state of Florida and in the rest of the world, 1,600 doesn't go into 400. It never has and it never will. The real-world data from Florida shows the mRNA vaccines are resulting in vaccine harms disproportionate to the number of vaccines being administered when compared to all previous vaccinations. And this backs up the clear warning signal from our own yellow card system in the UK. Data held on the UK, US Government National Library of Medicine was used for research by Dr Joseph Fryman, which details the frequency of serious adverse events following vaccination with both Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. For clarity, Mr Deputy Speaker, a serious adverse event is defined as anything that results in death, is life-threatening at the time of the event, results in inpatient hospitalisation or prolongation of existing hospitalisation, persistent or significant disability or incapacity, a congenital anomaly or birth defect, or something considered a medic as medically important based on medical judgment. Using that definition, the study confirms that there are 10.1 serious adverse events for every 10,000 Pfizer vaccinations administered. Mr Deputy Speaker, that means that one in every 990 people vaccinated with the Pfizer booster will have a serious adverse event. The risk with the Moderna vaccine is even greater. 
There are 15.1 serious adverse events for every 10,000 Moderna jabs. That means one in 662 people vaccinated with the Moderna booster will have a serious adverse event. Combining the data for Pfizer and Moderna MRA vaccines or boosters, we can see that there are an average of 1,250 serious adverse events for every 1 million vaccine boosters administered. In other words, an average of 1 in 800 chance of a serious adverse event every time someone is boosted. So let's move on now to the UK Government data. On the 25th of January of this year, the Department of Health and Social Care published data from a presentation given, to the UK, given by the UK Health Security Agency to the JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. The data published split the population into groups by age and further divided those age groups into those considered healthy and at risk. The numbers needed to vaccinate, or the NNV, for each of these subgroups were calculated to firstly prevent a single hospitalisation and secondly a single serious hospitalisation requiring, requiring oxygen or intubation, effectively intensive care. The figures are stark, Mr Deputy Speaker. What I'm quoting from is the government's own published data. To prevent just one healthy adult aged between 50 and 59 from being hospitalised due to COVID, the government's own data states that 43,600 people had to be given an autumn booster jab. With a serious adverse event rate of 1 in 800, that means that in the healthy 50 to 59-year-old group, as a result of using the mRNA boosters, 55 people would die or be put into hospital with side effects to present, prevent one single case presenting of COVID preventing in hospital. The same data shows that for the healthy younger people, the number needs to be boosted to prevent a single hospital admission with COVID-19 is far higher. 92,500 booster jabs were required to be administered to prevent one hospitalisation due to COVID in the healthy 40 to 49 year old group, which would simultaneously have put 116 people at probability of death or serious adverse reaction into hospital from the jab. The healthy 30 to 39 year old age group required 210,400 booster jabs to prevent a single COVID hospitalisation. So 263 of this group will have been into hospital or sadly died as a result of the booster side effects just to keep one COVID case out of hospital. But the data gets worse because hospitalisation doesn't necessarily mean a serious medical intervention such as intubation or, oxy or, or oxygen. To prevent severe hospitalisation from COVID-19, the numbers needed to be boosted become astronomical. I would suggest that this is the real benchmark for comparison with the risks of death or serious adverse events from the boosters themselves. So the government's own data shows that in healthy adults aged 50 to 59, it was necessary to give 256,400 booster jabs to prevent just one severe hospitalisation, putting 321 people into hospital with a serious side effect from the booster, uh, which includes obviously risk of death. For 40 to 49 year olds, that number increases to 932,500 who need to be boosted to keep one COVID patient out of ITU, putting potentially 1,165 people into hospital with serious harms, death or disability. And for the healthy 30 to 39 year olds, no one knows the answer to the number needed to be boosted to prevent a serious hospitalisation because the government's own data says that there's never been such a case of this age group being put into intensive care due to the current variant of COVID-19. But many, indeed on average, one in 800 of them, of this group that's been boosted, will have died or been disabled or seriously harmed by the booster itself. Let me focus now on the most vulnerable group for which the government data is available. The over 70s with comorbidities, the most vulnerable group in our society. According to the government's own data, it would be necessary to administer 800 vaccine boosters to prevent just one hospitalisation for a patient over the age of 70 in this highest risk group. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, that means that all the most vulnerable group in our society are doing, by being boosted, is swapping one risk from Covid of hospitalisation for exactly the same risk from the booster itself. But of course, in the process, Big Pharma is making huge profits. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've looked at the health implications of the vaccine programme. Now I want to look at some of the costs implications of the booster programme in the UK. Total funding of COVID-19 vaccination programme in the UK up to the end of March this year is budgeted at £8.3 billion. In February 2022, the GP online website, Championing General Practice Professionals, published that GPs and community pharmacies were being paid £24 per dose for administering vaccines. That figure increased to £34 per dose at dedicated vaccine centres. These costs, of course, do not include the cost of the experimental uh, vaccines themselves. For ease of calculation, I will count those at £20 per dose across the board. I will be generous and use the lower of the two figures for administering the vaccine, giving a total cost of £44 per dose. But even then, I do, we see from the government's own data Using boosters, it cost over £1.9 million to prevent just one hospitalisation among healthy 50 to 59-year-olds, and over £11 million to prevent one serious hospitalisation due to COVID-19 in this age group. The cost to the taxpayer of preventing a hospitalisation of one healthy 40 to 49-year-old is over £4 million using boosters, and for healthy 30 to 39-year-olds, uh, the cost of preventing just one hospitalisation is over £9 million, Mr Deputy Speaker. Of course, to prevent serious hospitalisation in all these groups, the cost is far, far higher. It is, of course, worth noting that in setting up the vaccine programme, the government indemnified vaccine manufacturers, which gave them total cover against all future claims of the adverse effects of their products. Given what I've already explained about the incidence of serious side effects, that cost may well be extremely significant to the taxpayer on top of the obvious human tragedy and loss which is self-evidently happening. The data is clear. For all healthy people and all those considered at risk under 70, the probability of being seriously harmed by COVID are seriously outweighed by the risk associated from the experimental vaccines and boosters. Even for the most vulnerable group, the over 70s, with health problems, the risks are absolutely identical. The government data comments not only on the efficacy and effectiveness of the autumn booster campaign, which I've quoted from, we've already had that, but it also looks forward to this year's booster campaign. Not unsurprisingly, it predicts the same level of efficacy from the same boosters put into the same arms. Surely, in light of the data, um, that we're not going to continue with this absolute madness. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, if we were to perpetuate this, it, it, what we'll actually be doing is engaging in very expensive state-sponsored self-harm on a national level. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the winter of 2020, the experimental mRNA vaccines were announced to the British public as being safe and effective. That narrative was repeated by the Vaccine Minister in her response to my speech in this place on the 13th of December. It is interestingly, interesting that today the NHS website describes the experimental vaccines as safe and important, and it describes serious side effects as being very rare. But the truth, as we know, is somewhat different. One in 800 is not rare, especially when the public is expected to take multiple doses, exposing themselves again and again to the same risk. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the government needs to be honest about this, just like they need to be honest about the fact that the MHRA is funded 86% by Big Pharma. The experimental mRNA vaccines from the manufacturer's own trial data are not safe, with an average of 1 in 800 people taking them facing death or serious injury as a result. Despite the initial and repeated assurances, the experimental mRNA vaccines from the government's own data they are not effective at preventing infection, transmission or hospitalisation from COVID-19. The experimental mRNA vaccines are not necessary given the risk-benefit of the treatment. And the experimental mRNA vaccines are costing the country a fortune and creating huge pressure on the NHS from the side effects. I would therefore ask the Minister, given that the data released on the 25th of January by the UK Health Security Agency 
was actually presented to the JCVI on the 25th of October 2022, why was the booster rollout not halted last October, given the clear lack of efficacy and the evidence of risks being greater than the benefit to all age groups, except possibly the over 70s, with underlying health conditions where the risk was absolutely identical? Was the data presented uh, to the JCVI passed to the MHRA? If so, when? And if not, why not? Why were the MHRA still asking the government to authorise the experimental vaccines to be administered to children down to the age of six months of age in December 2022, six weeks after the booster efficacy data was received by the JCVI? If the data was not passed to the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, surely the JCVI should have spoken out against the vaccination of small children last December. I'm sure, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, despite the members of the JCVI having declared an interest of over a billion pounds between them of investments in Big Pharma, uh, this would never have influenced uh, their judgment. Can the Minister also confirm the fact that two-thirds of NHS staff refused last autumn's booster. The simple facts are that in light of the government's own data, um, COVID vaccinations and boosters are not effective, and from the evidence of the yellow card system, they're not safe, and to the UK taxpayer, they are not value for money. Indeed, given the side effects, Mr Deputy Speaker, if they were free, we couldn't afford them. The only ones who really benefit from the booster rollout are Big Pharma, with their licence to print money, and indemnification against the harms of their, pro their products cause. Once again, Mr Deputy Speaker, Big Pharma have put profits before people and on this occasion governments across the globe have been their willing marketing agents. The whole COVID-19 narrative is slowly unravelling. As I believe I've demonstrated today, Mr Deputy Speaker, no one should have been boosted after the efficacy data was received on the 25th of October last year and no one should be boosted in future based on that data. Given the evidence of harms uh, by the boosters, I now believe that we have the full explanation of both the continuing excess deaths we've seen since the pandemic, 63,000 excess deaths in England and Wales in the last 12 months, and also the reason for the huge and unrelenting pressure of demand on the NHS. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's the vaccines and the boosters and their side effects. Sadly, I am confident that I'll be proved correct I sincerely wish it was not so. But the longer it takes that our government to accept the truth, the more people will be harmed and die. The first step to putting right a problem is always to admit there is a problem. The government narrative of safe and effective is in tatters, as evidenced by their own data. Three months on from my original speech in this House, we have surely now sacrificed enough of our citizens on the uh, lives on the altar of ignorance and unfettered corporate greed to satisfy anyone. I therefore call on the government to immediately stop the mRNA vaccine booster programme and initiate a full public inquiry into not only the vaccine harms, but how every agency and institution set up to protect the public interest have failed so abysmally in their duties. I look forward to the Minister's response. I'm aware that it's neither his area of responsibility or expertise, and I will accept that any questions he can't answer at the dispatch box today that he will send to me in writing. Minister Wilkins. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, as the Honourable Gentleman says, I'm responding um, to the debate on behalf of the Honourable Member for Lewis. Vaccines have underpinned the government's strategy for living with COVID. I'll give you the link to that and you can um, listen to the Minister's full... Well, not, he's not actually a Minister, he's a cardboard cutout. The main qualification for what he was doing there is the ability to read. He didn't actually bother sending in a, a regular uh, government minister. Um, suffice it to say that he didn't answer any of Mr. Bridgen's specific questions. Does the fact that the MRA, um, Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Authority is 86% funded by external industry have any bearing on the matter? Didn't answer that. That the JVCI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, has got one billion investments in big pharma between them. Didn't answer that one. And uh, any of the specific mathematical evidences that, that Mr. Bridging gave also weren't answered. So I'll put the link. You can watch it all for yourself. And um, 
it's it, it's it, it's great that we've still got this parliamentary democracy in the UK because um, clearly Mr. Bridgen can say things that I'm not at liberty to say. Um, so I won't comment further. But um, thank you. I hope you've managed to listen to all that because I, I think every word of that really was well worth listening to and uh, demands a response. And and of course, things that are applicable in the UK are going to be applicable in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, wherever there's been a similar um, public, uh, public, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, public health uh, initiative. Thank you for watching. A well, warm welcome to this video. It's Sunday the 19th of March. Now, you probably watched that video we used a few days ago from uh, Andrew Bridgen, Member of Parliament, who gave uh, a speech in Parliament in the UK, uh, questioning, shall we say, the official government narrative on COVID uh, vaccination. And of course, it was given to a, an empty house. But I'm going to show you something now which is uh, bemusing at best and uh, really quite sinister at worst. Let's just have a look at the clip now that was played uh, or they managed to get from the parliamentary cameras. It's not very good resolution, but try and watch it. Just stick with this. Really quite interesting. So Mr. Deputy Speaker introduces Mr. Bridgen. Everyone starts leaving as if on cue. But this guy here comes across and talks to these two opposition MPs who promptly leave. What is going on here? Now, let's... Let's look at this again. Uh, Mr. Bridgen there begins his speech again. Let's look at this again. So Mr. Speaker announces the... Now this guy here from the second bench, conservative bench, he taps this guy on the shoulder as if to say, Oi, go and do your job, mate. He immediately gets up. These two are sitting here waiting for the debate to begin. He walks across, crouched, These two seem to see him coming. He walks up, he points, he presumably says something. And then they promptly leave. <laughs> so tap, get up, walk across, tell them to leave. Obediently, I assume these are Lib Dem MPs, they, they, they leave. And he, he walks back crouched just in case anyone uh, sees him and makes a sharp exit from the chamber, crouched over, in case he's observed. <laughs> and these two leave, and everyone else leaves, and the entire, the entire benches leave, and Mr Bridgen begins his speech. So, rather strange, some might think. Now, if you're from the United Kingdom, you'll realise just what a bizarre event we've just witnessed on these videos. Absolutely incredible. It's almost as if the opposition is obeying exactly what the uh, government benches uh, have told it to do. Now, the, the whole point of parliamentary democracy is we have an opposition. So Mr. Bridgen could have given his speech and then the opposition could have said, well, thank you for your advance notice of this speech, Mr. Bridgen. I've had opportunity to consult with Professor so-and-so from such and such a university and he puts a different interpretation on this figure. Let, let, let's discuss this. Let's debate this. That, that's the whole point of Parliament. Well, while I accept your figures, Mr. Bridgen, because they're government figures, we have to accept those. Let's consider your interpretation of them and other possible interpretations and other possible correlations. That's what government opposition is supposed to do. Complete, utter failure to do that. And now I think I know who the individuals were on this uh, on, on this video, but I'm not going to say because I can't absolutely confirm it. But this is utterly bizarre. Does it mean all this punch and judy politics that we have across the dispatch box it is just a complete sham because we've got here that the, the the conservative front bench saying to the opposition apparently oh off you go off you go and them say them saying oh yes sir certainly sir it just it just doesn't it goes against the fund it's a bit like if you're in the states <laughs> Let, let's let's imagine donald trump says to nancy pelosi would you be free for a romantic dinner for two and she says oh yes mr trump oh, and, and by the way will i do hope you're free for a couple of hours afterwards <laughs> it just doesn't happen you know we don't have this cross aisle as we call it 
separation. So something very strange going on here. At best, bemusing. And the way that Tory guy sort of snuck out like that, it's just, um, we need explanations for this. We need transparency. And I know thousands of you have asked for it on the comments. Uh, what has gone on here? Is there some sort of official narrative that's being enforced that the opposition are colluding with? Well, that video could intimate that. Um, who knows? Some might think it intimates that. It looks like it could intimate that. Um, of course, we, we hope it's not the case and we look forward to uh, clarification and transparency. So let's hope we get some uh, transparency on this issue soon because barriers to transparency are indeed unwelcome. So here we see the house for Mr. Bridgin's speech. This is Andrew Bridgin here. This is Sir Christopher Chope, long-term seeker after truth. This guy, I think he's the sergeant at arms. He has to be there in case there's any fights or something or to protect the chamber. Um, front bench have to be there. This one on the second bench seemed to be chit-chatting to these ones and on a mobile phone. Speaker has to be there. These are legal dignitaries. Um, so basically a completely empty chamber. No one on the opposition benches. Now, to be deliberately cynical, this is uh, the House when the MPs were debating their 10% pay rise under uh, George Osborne. Uh, plenty of people there then. Uh, standing room only, in fact, when they were debating the MPs' pay rise. This one, fairly full, MP plan to debate uh, paid consultancy. So the, uh, the uh, don't think this quite worked out, but they were debating whether MPs should be allowed external paid consultancies or not. Relating to the health of the nation, we have an empty uh, house. Well, let's hope we're not dealing with a cross-party uh, conspiracy to uh, allow one single narrative with no deviation from that narrative. Now, I don't actually think we are. They're not that well organised and they're not that cohesive. But there's certainly events there that need an explanation and we look forward to those explanations. Of course, any of the members involved are more than welcome on the channel. Don't hold your breath for it coming out on the BBC and other mainstream media. I don't think it will. But you've watched, so thank you for watching.